Hello everyone, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And it is Easter Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a great day. This is the central day of the Christian year. And this is a day to rejoice and to thank God for the gift of His Son Jesus, uh, who has risen from the dead and has brought new life to you and to me. We're glad that you've tuned in to worship with us. And I'm joined here by the Westermeyer family, Joel and Annie, Mary Beth, Matthew and Aaron, and our music director, Garrett Woods. And I'm grateful to this team for all of their hard work. And Matthew Westermeyer is our liturgist today. Thank you very much, Matthew, for, uh, for helping lead us in worship. So let us celebrate the resurrection. Let us now go to God and worship God in a spirit of joy. Please join me in our call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hope is alive. Hope is alive indeed. God's love is eternal. Hallelujah. Let us give thanks for what God has done. Our opening hymn is Christ the Lord is Risen Today, number 216.
please join my invocation. God of grace and power, we come and rejoice in Christ's empty tomb. We come trusting in the good news that tells us that Christ is with us. For the risen Christ is living proof that you care about our lives, O God. The risen Christ offers us glimpses of hope, even in our tears, because the tomb is not quiet. It speaks. It proclaims. It is a promise of eternal life. Thank you, gracious and almighty God. Amen. Very early in the morning, God created all that is good and beautiful. Very early in the morning, a mother placed her newborn in a manger. Very early in the morning, the good news was shared with frightened friends that Jesus was risen and alive in our midst. Let us confess the fears and the amazement we bring this morning. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God of resurrection and grace, help us in our pain, despair, and fear so that we are not prone to follow the path of hopelessness. Help us to instead be like the risen Christ and rise up as a brave and holy people, living beyond our pain, despair, and fear by remaining hopeful in your steadfast love. Help us, we pray. Amen. God hears our prayers of grace and mercy and raises our countenance from despair into resurrection joy. God meets us in our human suffering, comforts us in our tears, and offers to us new hope. Hallelujah. And now we come to our time of pastoral prayer. I invite you on this Easter Sunday to think about the needs uh, that you bring to worship today, uh, the concerns, and also the joys. And we will lift them up to God during this sacred moment. Let us turn now to God in prayer. In the joy and hope of this Easter morning, we sing, Alleluia, with the fullness of hearts, Christ is risen. Love is stronger than death. Alleluia. In the joy and hope of this Easter morning, in the midst of our singing and shouting, we know that there are those who are bewildered and sad. We pray for those who have no hope, for those who suffer from loneliness and fear. We pray for those places and peoples in our world where death and domination rule, where imperial powers ignore the poor, where war never ends, where children are hungry, where parents grieve because they cannot provide, where accidents happen and death abounds senselessly. We pray for those held hostage to addiction and chronic illness that debilitates. In the joy and the hope of this Easter morning, we realize the depth and breadth of what it means to be your Easter people, O God. For we are the ones who are called to go into the places in our lives and world to work for justice and life for all in your creation. It is up to us to bear witness to the promise of resurrection, to hold those in despair and believe for them that love is stronger than death. In the joy and hope of this Easter morning, O God, give us the courage to bear your living love in every corner of our lives so that your peaceable realm will be so here on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the risen Christ we pray, Alleluia. And now let us pray to the Lord in silence.
We offer our prayers to you, O Lord, and in the name of Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray with a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. The apostle writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through which also you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Our Gospel reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid." May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of my favorite television shows that I watched when I was a little boy was Lost in Space. Maybe some of you watched Lost in Space as well. It's been remade a couple of times and has been made into a, a feature film a time or two. Lost in Space told the story, week after week, of the Robinson family that was selected to take part in a uh, space expedition to Alpha Centauri, our solar system's closest star and planetary system. The Robinson's family mission was to begin colonizing one of the planets of Alpha Centauri. But you may remember, if you're a fellow Lost in Space fan, the ship ended up being thrown off course and damaged due to a meteor shower, and their mission was further sabotaged by Dr. Zachary Smith, who was working as an agent for an unnamed foreign government. Dr. Smith programmed the robot to destroy the ship several hours after it launched, 
And so the Robinsons and the crew member with them, Major Don West and Dr. Smith, became literally lost in space. The story is set in 1997, uh, and it premiered on September 15, 1965. The first episode was called The Reluctant Stowaway, referring to Dr. Smith, who hid aboard the spacecraft to do the uh, sabotaging that he planned, and who ended up being trapped on board during the uh, ship's uh, launching. Toward the end of the episode, Professor John Robinson attempts to fix the ship's sensor systems and must do so outside of the ship. The cord that is keeping him tethered to the ship comes loose and he begins to float away from the Jupiter II. And Maureen Robinson goes out of the ship to try and help her husband. She's trying to get a new cable to him and John is desperately trying to reach for it. And then the film freezes. And we see these words coming across the screen, to be continued next week, same time, same channel. And you're left just waiting to see what will happen a week later. And then each episode, each week, ended the same way with a dramatic moment and a freezing of the scene and the words, to be continued, same time, same channel. The old Batman series ended the same way, didn't it? Same bat time, same bat channel and many other television programs. The idea is to leave the viewer in suspense so that you and I will tune in next week and keep watching the series. It's a smart method for television writers and producers. It's a great way to keep you and I tuning in. Once we are involved in a story, we want to see how the story ends. We want to know what happens next, what happens after that. The same is true with novels that we read, especially if it's a good novel, with an interesting plot and characters we have come to care about and uh, as we have read the book. We keep turning the pages because we want to know what's going to happen next. You may have noticed that our gospel reading from Mark's gospel ends at verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. If you open a Bible, you'll find that there are other verses following verse 8. However, some of the oldest manuscripts, some of the oldest ancient manuscripts of Mark's Gospel end at verse 8. And New Testament scholars will tell us the, the, the better, more reliable manuscripts end at verse 8. And many New Testament scholars have noticed and noted that compared to the other Gospels, if verse 8 really was Mark's intended ending, that seems like a rather abrupt way to close the Gospel story. And so it may be that uh, later on, uh, some of the other verses were added to try, to try to bring the story to a close, because that rather abrupt way, saying that the women were afraid, seems like sort of an abrupt ending. The women leave the tomb empty, conf uh, empty tomb confused and afraid, it's possible that Mark included a longer ending and the final part of his narrative was destroyed. It's also possible that Mark himself intended for the story to end at verse 8. If that is indeed what Mark intended, it may be that he was leaving the story open for the reader to fill in. What do the women do? How did the news of the empty tomb affect their lives and change their lives? What changed? How did the world change because of the empty tomb that they encountered. And Mark is not only asking the reader to write the ending of the story for the women who found the tomb empty, Mark is also inviting us to put ourselves in the story and to consider what comes next. What happens next in my life now that I have encountered the empty tomb, now that I have encountered the Easter message of the risen Christ? What happens next in my life now that I have heard the announcement of the angelic being that Jesus is not in the tomb, but he has been raised from the dead, what happens next in my life? What will I do with this joyous and powerful news of Jesus' resurrection? Donald Strobe has said, You see, there is a sense in which the gospel record is never really finished. You and I are part of the story. And Mark is inviting you and me to be a part of this story, this resurrection story, this Easter story, this good news story. 
Mark Trotter and others have suggested that the reason for the additional verses at the end of Mark's gospel can be attributed to ancient church leaders who were concerned about the ending of Mark being too open-ended. Perhaps they felt that Mark's gospel should end more like the other gospels, with a more clear ending to the story, a more complete account of what happened after the women discovered the tomb to be empty. According to Mark Trotter, this is Mark's resurrection narrative. It is just eight verses long. There are 12 more verses following the eighth verse, but everyone agrees that they have been added on by a nervous editor who didn't think that the gospel would sell if it didn't have a conventionally spectacular ending. So they added resurrection appearances of Jesus, the granting of supernatural powers to the apostles, and a final scene with divine pronouncements. That is the stuff of popular religion. The last 12 verses of the gospel were added to provide that ending. Even the most conservative biblical scholars, he says, agree with that, that the gospel ends with the eighth verse. The eighth verse reads like this, And then they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. It's an extraordinary ending. It just ends by saying they were astonished. They, they, were, they were accustomed to miracles, but it wasn't, uh, uh, they, they weren't astonished because of a miracle. They, they were accustomed to miracles. They used miracles to explain all kinds of things as we do today. Uh, it would explain by natural causes. Miracles were not strange to them. They expected miracles to happen. What was not expected what would have brought about the kind of astonishment that the gospel says came to these women was grace. Grace is what astonished them. That God who came into this world to redeem it out of love and was rejected by this world would continue to love the world. That is the Easter message that nothing, nothing can stop God now from redeeming the world. And you and me and all of us in it. Today, we too find the tomb empty. Today, we are also hearing that good news, that Christ has been raised from the dead, he and He is risen. And now, we must decide, what are we going to do next? What happens next? Will tomorrow morning just be another Monday morning? Will we begin a new week that will just look like any other week? Or will we decide that the empty tomb has made a difference and is making a difference? a dramatic, transformative, life-changing difference. If we decide that the resurrection of Jesus is the life-changing event that the gospel tells us it is, then we need to make the rest of the story about our going out into the world, living as people who have put their faith and their trust in the risen Jesus and in the God who would not allow Jesus to remain in the grave. But through God's grace, through God's love, through God's power, ensured that death would not have the final say, and who ensured that fear would not have the last word, and who ensured that hopelessness would not have the final word either. Vicki Kruger offers the following words of advice to aspiring writers on how to end a story. She writes, There are endless ways to end a story, but few hard and fast rules. Yet every writer knows that the story must reach a satisfying conclusion. One of her suggestions for creating a satisfying conclusion, a satisfying ending to a story, is to include an epilogue. An epilogue <coughs> excuse me, is a section or speech at the end of a book or play that serves as a comment on or a conclusion to what has happened. Vicki Kruger writes this about the epilogue. The story ends, but life goes on. How many times have you wondered after the house lights come back on what happened next to the characters in a movie? Readers care about characters and stories. An epilogue helps satisfy their curiosity. The story ends, she says, but life goes on. One could say that an essential component of the good news of the resurrection, our gospel accounts come to an end, but you and I are part of the epilogue. We are very much a part of what happens next. And so, what happens next, sisters and brothers in Christ? Leonard Sweet writes this, he said, Easter is all about a four-letter word, and Christians, he says, are full of it, or at least we're supposed to be full of it, and the four-letter word is life, L-I-F-E. What did you think I was talking about? Life, he says. 
New life, whole life, abundant life, redeemed life, resurrected life. The purpose of life is not death, Easter says. The purpose of life is life. The purpose of life is life, a life that triumphs over death forever. Celebrating Easter is the best thing that the church can do because it is a celebration, he says, of all that is good, all that is true, and all that is beautiful. Leonard Sweet goes on to say, In fact, I would make the case this morning that celebrating Easter is the greatest public service the church can perform for the world. Why? Because it is the reality of Easter that makes everything else we, do, we would do possible. Remember Jesus' final words on the cross, It is finished. When the soldiers are taking Jesus' body down from the cross, stabbed Him with a spear point, blood and water came out. That rush of fluids revealed what was the actual final cause of death for Jesus, says Leonard Sweet. Jesus died of a broken heart, a burst aorta. The breaking of Jesus' heart was what finished the sacri uh, Jesus' sacrifice. On Easter morning, the great surprise is that sacrifice was not the end of Jesus' mission. Out of Jesus' broken heart, there emerged a new heart, a resurrected heart, an unbreakable, unstoppable heart. Out of the last Adam's split side, a new Eve was conceived, the bride of Christ, the church, whose life revolves around the water of baptism and the blood of communion. On Easter, it is finished, he says. But it, on Easter, it is finished becomes now it begins. Now it begins. Life begins anew with the resurrected rhythms of that Easter heart. It is an Easter heart that the resurrected Jesus offered to all who believed in Him, all who read the signs and symbols of new life God had left at the empty tomb. Indeed, God has blessed us. God has gifted us with life on Easter, abundant life, complete life, and hopeful life. God has given us the amazing gift of life through the resurrection of Jesus. God has given us an amazing gift. Now, sisters and brothers, what are we going to do with this gift? What are we going to do with this life? What happens next? You decide. And with God's help, it will be something wonderful. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 227, In the Garden. Speaks and the sound of his. 
on this day, we remember that Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb with the intent to anoint the crucified body of Jesus, and astonishingly, she finds an empty tomb where Jesus once laid. Now what? God's angels and the risen Christ meet Mary Magdalene in her sorrow and speak hope into her heart. For the resurrection narrative reveals that love is alive and moving among us. The risen Christ helps us to remember that despair is not the end of our journey. The risen Christ also speaks of God's ever-present love and gives the church resurrection hope. In that love and hope, we manifest God's never-ending love in the world by the giving of our time, talents, and financial resources as an Easter people. It is with Christ's limitless and restorative love that we humbly and graciously offer back to God a portion of what God has given to us. Please join me in a prayer of dedication. God of love, we offer our gifts of time, spiritual gifts, and financial gifts as a sign of our love for you and the world. We ask a special blessing on these gifts as you meet us in our suffering and raise us up so that all may come to know of your abiding love. We give these gifts as you have given them to us. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. On this Easter Sunday, we celebrate the Sacrament of Communion and we come to the table of the Lord and we are reminded that Christ invites all of us to His table. I invite you to affirm our faith as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The resurrection has begun. The day of celebration is here. Alleluia. We gather at the table to share in the banquet of life. Here we meet all who share with us the hope for a brighter future. All who wish to follow the way of life are welcome to eat and drink at God's table. Let us eat together. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, source of life, living word, and bond of love, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who reminds us that even in fear-filled days, cloaked with the powers of death, 
your eternal love arises and never leaves us. As people of faith, we remember all those who have gone before, people like Moses and Miriam leading their people to freedom, like Sarah and Abraham seeking a new life in a strange land, like Peter and Mary proclaiming an empty tomb and life beyond the cross. We remember these and many others, named and unnamed, who have embraced your life, your hope, and moved into a new age. And we trust that in remembering and retelling their stories, we too can take the leap into new life. Deep among all those memories, we remember the life of a special one, Jesus, child of Mary, born of a woman. He grew to adulthood among people who struggled daily for life. Baptized by John, he embraced the life to which you called him. He taught and preached a vision of a world where all divisions were broken down, where all had what they needed for abundant life, where the reign of God was as real on earth as in heaven. And though the powerful in this world fought back, he stood strong. When offered a chance to take the easy way, he overcame his own fear and instead prayed, Yet thy will be done. Even though they put him to death, you raised him to life, vindicating his vision and bringing hope and healing to the world. For we rejoice with all your people, with the angels, because life is stronger than death, as we proclaim the glory of your name. In this meal, we remember Jesus, his promises, and the price he paid for who he was, what he said, and what he did for our benefit. On the night before Jesus died, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, and poured it, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. In sharing this meal, we live out the mystery of our faith. We remember Christ's life and love and friendship and teaching. We remember Christ dying and rising to life again. Bless this bread and this cup. The wheat and the grape, O Lord, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower. These simple elements are shared in community so that we may taste and see your goodness and become one body in Christ. For it is through Christ, in Christ, and with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ. The bread of life the lifeblood of Christ, the cup of blessing, the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat.
and the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And now I invite you to join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. O oh Christ, we thank you for this feast of life, fed by your love and strengthened by your life. We humbly accept your call to go into this world, to live with hope, and to share your joy. You commission us to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, and love as we have been loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 224, Christ Arose. Thank you for joining us for worship on this Easter Sunday. May God bless you as we continue to celebrate the resurrection in the weeks ahead. May the risen Christ go with you. May your life be filled with hope, with peace, and with joy because Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. May God's abiding love and hope give us new life. May God's unmerited grace and mercy keep us hope-filled. And may God's restorative justice bring perfect peace to us all. For Christ is risen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Go, sisters and brothers, in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Savior, He's in the world today. I know.
Walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow.